Now, as a novelist and a film director, I love telling stories. And I'd like to tell you a story right now, if I may. It starts in 1920 in Pretoria, South Africa, where a young baby girl is born into an Indian Muslim family. By the age of 16, she's married to a man she doesn't know, and she has four children in quick succession. And that really is about it. There is no sense of a career, no possibility of love, no prospects to speak of. Now that woman was my grandmother, and that story really upset me. So, as writers are liable to do, I wanted to write that story down. But I first of all wanted to change all the parts about it that I didn't like. I wanted to break all of those rules that my grandmother had been pushed to live by and replace them with completely new values. And that became the basis of my first novel and my first film, The World Unseen, which I'll show you a clip of very shortly. I can actually act out the trailer as well. I might need a little bit of help. Would you? Oh, I'm so sorry, Maria, next time. <laughs> Deadlocks in the country. You like it then? We need to work hard. That's all. Amina, this gentleman here is looking for someone to help build in the garden. I can do it. She thinks a lot of herself. Maybe she should. She owns a business and she's one of us. Stop that bloody noise! You all know it's an offense for blacks to eat in the same place as whites. There are no whites here. Present company excluded. Why should you take that risk? Because I hate apartheid. I came to see if Miriam would cook for the cafe. Your place is here with me. I wish I could be more like you. Be careful what you wish for. Let me help you. That's a stupid thing to do. We don't owe those people anything! I didn't know you had a fearless streak. Just a housewife and a mother. Has anyone ever looked after you? not my first screenplay. My, the very first screenplay that I wrote was a very delicate story about an unrequited love affair that could never happen, and it was set in 1950s Oxford. So I sent it off to Hollywood, and a production company picked it up almost immediately, and I was ecstatic. I even took a break from writing just so I could work on my Oscar speech, and I was waiting for them to give me a call. I waited, and, and this phone call came. And they called to say they had $15 million to make the film. But there was one catch. They needed two sex scenes and a nude scene in a story of unrequited love. So <laughs> I realized then that their rules said that if you were lucky enough as a first-time writer to even get looked at by Hollywood, that you should just do what you were told. And then you should try and work your way up the ladder. 
But the problem with that was it broke my rule, my personal rule of having integrity with the story that I was telling. So I thought about it and I realized that my ideal producer was somebody who had that integrity, who was passionate about my work, and who was a great entrepreneur. And then it occurred to me that I was living with somebody who, who sort of fit most of those criteria. So I uh, persuaded my life partner, Hanan, to set up a production company with me called Enlightenment Productions. And I was happy because actually I was abiding by one major Hollywood rule, which is you should always sleep with the producer. And, um, and it worked. And <laughs> so, uh, Enlightenment Productions for us is all about creating strong female characters. And what I really want is for those characters to think very differently by the end of the film than they did at the beginning of the film. It's that dichotomy that I love, whether it's challenging apartheid in South Africa, or whether in our upcoming film, Despite the Falling Snow, you have an American spy who, in Cold War Moscow who falls in love with a communist politician. There's that push to give new values to characters who thought they knew everything. Now, when it comes to financing these films, financing The Wild Unseen and I Can't Think Straight, which was another romantic comedy that we were doing at that time, the industry liked the dichotomies in the script, but they didn't like that we didn't have big name stars. They didn't like that it was so Indian and South African. Basically, they wanted safe and they wanted security. So we had to look in unusual places for financing, and we found financing unusually for films entirely through private equity. And even more unusually, that private equity came entirely from women. These were very savvy businesswomen who loved the stories the way we did and wanted to see them up on the screen and see if they could make an impact. So for small, independent films, they did well. They opened at the Toronto Film Festival. We got distribution in the US and in Europe, and we won a lot of awards. But what really blew us away was the digital response to these films. Just the clips and the trailers alone on YouTube currently stand at about 60 million hits. Now on the back of that, what happened was that hundreds of women and then thousands from all over the world started to email because they had identified with these characters, and because the characters in the film had found a way to change their lives and their way of thinking, these women were also challenging the lives that were prescribed for them. They were escaping from arranged marriages, or pushing to start a career, or simply becoming more comfortable with who they were as people. Now, for Hanan and I, as, as two women uh, from in, a, in a relationship, both from fairly conservative Eastern backgrounds. This, this wasn't a great way to have a laugh at the dinner table. Our families were quite traumatized by our relationship for many, many, many years. But one of the really beautiful and magical things about storytelling is that 16 years of complete trauma can be condensed into one single minute of movie time. And I'd like to show you a small clip from I Can't Think Straight to illustrate that. I made you some best. I need to talk to you. What's the matter? Are you sick? No, I'm fine. Actually, very good. Happy. Huh. Where's Dad? In town with a client. He'll be back home soon. Ali called. Oh, shit, I forgot about him. Well, he's a wonderful boy. Mom. I'm not happy with him. Then Auntie Gulchan's son is looking for someone. He's very successful. He's a bookie. Well, and tall and handsome. He's six foot seven, all I can see is his navel. Well, then you'll have to old children. <laughs> Mom, I can't be happy with him. The way I'm not happy with Ali. And... And I've always known why. But... I was hoping that the reason I thought was the reason might not really be the reason. And that things would change, but they never have, not really. Now I know for sure that what I've been feeling all these years is actually the right thing. Do you want Jesus? There's nothing wrong with it. I haven't got Jedi like that. I'm trying to say it's Mom is Ando. Listen to I me. Got I'm Ali. gay! What did I miss? I'm gay. But I've only been gone two hours. <laughs> Thank you.
I guess my final point is that however we choose to consume stories, whether they make us laugh or whether they make us cry, whether we're buried in 200 pages of an old novel or whether we're choosing to enjoy a 30-second clip on YouTube, the real power of stories comes in the stories that we each of us tell ourselves every single day. And by that, I mean the stories that we tell ourselves about our bodies, about our relationships, and about our lives in general. Now, last year was the first time that I considered using documentary film to tell a story. And it was in making that film, which is called The House of Tomorrow, that I really began to understand the true power that we all have to create our own realities by the stories that we tell ourselves. Hanan, who is of Palestinian origin, and Leah Aronson, who is uh, Israeli, they met on the back of a bus in India and decided that they would create a forum for Israeli women and Palestinian women to come together specifically to share each other's stories. It was a magical day because these women really are living in a conflict zone and they never get an opportunity to meet. Now, we wanted to extend the magic of that day and so I was able to film interviews with some of these extraordinary women. Now, like you and I, they are entrepreneurs, they are mothers, they are teachers. But extraordinary because they live in a conflict zone. And really, what can they do about it? In practical terms, really nothing. But they can choose to tell a different story. They can choose to view their enemies as neighbors. They can choose to spend more time thinking about peace than they do about the conflict. And if you wonder if that really does make any difference, I've been there and I can tell you that I believe it makes all the difference in the world. So, digitalization has changed the way we see and hear stories forever. Our Twitter feeds give us a thousand stories every minute. Novelists can publish without having a traditional publisher. A filmmaker can make a movie and distribute a movie without going anywhere near Hollywood. But I think the true power and the real rule-breaking when it comes to storytelling is in something that we often forget about. And that is that we all have the power to create our own stories for ourselves and make them come true every single day. And on that note, I would like to end with a very short clip from The House of Tomorrow. When there's a belief of something that you love and uh, you dream of it and you really believe in it and love it, um, you can do it even if you have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of difficulties. I, I very much identify as a Palestinian. Yes, the Jewish people need a place to be because we've been persecuted. Everybody is entitled to his own nationality, to have his own state. There is the occupied, the occupied Palestine and the free Palestine. There's no Israel. I don't think there's enough opportunity for Palestinians or Arabs and Jews to mix. The only contact we have with them is when they are soldiers. We just accept it as a fact. My family's business was bombed by a Muslim woman. And no one in their right mind can think that things are normal. You do it with respect, not with humiliation. changes in their own lives, in their small ways and big ways. And we all need to do whatever it is that we can do. I think that one of the greatest gifts of human interaction is finding out that we all share the same issues. Then it's just a matter of people living together, having to share the land. Just leaving to politicians, which we've tried for so long, is really not the answer. Finally, we begin to perceive the future as something that we can influence. I just keep going after, after what I'm trying to do, and no matter what. I simply, and perhaps in a silly way, believe that anything can be changed. Oh, I, I would imagine something without any borders.
you know, the more women are viewed as equals, truly equal partners, the more difference we will have. This is the dream of every one of us. Shared spaces, shared narrative. I think what we need to get there is a bit more imagination. Thank you.